Well, thanks for coming. I, uh, you know, would love to answer any questions if you guys want to do as much Q and A, and then maybe take a couple selfies, hug it out, and then I'll, <laughs> and then I'll, and then I'll get mentally prepared for my talk. Um, anybody have any questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Like, as someone transitioning straight out of, I suppose, a lot of finance and stuff like that, coming into the tech world, like, how much do you think is, te- like, how much technical expertise you need versus, like, coming to jack of all trades and just learning bits and bobs from where you can. I think it's predicated on the ambition and the life cycle of where you're at, right? I think the way I think about businesses is actually the way I think about parenting. I don't expect a three-year-old to have everything figured out yet, right? And so I think it depends on the makeup of a team. You know, you look at a team like this and everybody's gonna have their strengths and weaknesses. And the one thing I do see a lot of, because I'm a little bit more of a hustler entrepreneur and didn't come from a, I wasn't a developer, I came up from being selling stuff and then a wine store and so I get a lot of hustlers and and entrepreneurs that come to me that want to be in the tech business and they come up with these ideas and then they want a dev shop to build it for them and they're going to launch this huge bit. We're going to be the next Facebook because of this idea and then I go, you're in the tech business and you don't have a tech co-founder. Uh, you know, so, so I see that every day. So I think if the ambition is very large and it's tech centric, you need to have a tech co-founder to really build an actual big business. I think if you're building a fashion brand and there's products like Magento and Shopify and WordPress and already in the marketplace and your ambition is to build a $10 million scarf business, well then you don't need to be the tech co-founder. There's tools that can get you there through Shopify and maybe it's more about the marketing skills or how do you, you, know, how do you market the crayons. You, know, you don't necessarily need, so I think, it, I think you have to go backwards. I think the thing that everybody makes mistakes with, I think one of the best things I've ever done, and I really haven't, I articulated about my love of the journey, but I don't talk enough about the way I strategize. I kind of like playing the role of like charismatic crazy guy, but I, I definitely think about stuff quite a bit. And I think the best way to win is to know where the hell you're going. And so, and, and the reason I've been pushing self-awareness is not everybody here is destined to build a $500 million thing. I also think it's crazy that people don't realize how amazing it is to build a $1 million thing. If you can build a $1 million a year revenue business and run on 30% net profit, you have a crazy life. And so we have this whole world of everybody trying to achieve for something that's virtually impossible and they're putting themselves in a position where by trying to build something impossible, they're gonna end up working for a bank. Because the one thing that people haven't factored in yet is globally the economy has been pretty good for the last decade or at least eight years. And I, my biggest concern is the next economic slowdown. Right, and obviously Ireland's had different d- d- things going on in the UK and Brexit for the UK and the US and everybody has their own microeconomic things but I think the reality is globally right now things are good. You know, things, people are tense about politics economic realities and all the people that made money in the 2000s or have family money are pouring money into startup land. A rugby startup can actually get money from some individual you know, that made money prior. I mean the amount of $25,000 and $50,000 stupid checks I've written in the last five years. You know, and so when that goes away, what happens? And so I think, I think that um, that's a long-winded answer for a couple things. One, you need to know what your ambition is, right? Two, you have to figure out if what you're doing now is just the place where you're transitioning into the next chapter of your career or is this the thing that you want to try to build? And so if you actually decided from a strategical standpoint that the next two, three years is really just about learning, less posturing, faking it to make it, more just learning, tasting it, understanding the grass is not always greener, Yeah, startup land is better than finance land because people aren't as douchey or this and that, but there's a lot of things that aren't as good, like pressure, like it's all on you, like da 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 Well then if you've made the macro decision that this is a stepping stone and this is how you're gonna go about the world, all of a sudden you're not spending most of your time trying to figure out how to make the most money out of this. You're taking it in a totally different mindset. You've almost got a university-like mentality to the execution. You don't want to go out of business. You don't want to have to go back to get a job. But I would, I would, this is advice I'm giving, you know, I'm giving advice to everybody right now. You really have to know what you're doing. Like at the macro. And the other thing is you have to be flexible enough to know it changes. 
What your ambition is at, at 19 and 15 and 22 is different than what your ambition is at 41 and you have to be flexible in that reality. So I, I think it's a, it, it's a strategic answer. You know, and I think that um, I think you need to think about I think you need to think about tasting everything because you're a young man and you want to figure out what the hell you like and what you're good at. There's just an incredible, you know, like kind of access point of like what you're great at and what you love. When you stumble into being somebody like me, you really win. When what you're naturally great at is what you naturally love the most, and away you go. The amount of people that I meet every day that are great at something but have no interest in being a CFO. They love, they're insane with numbers, but they don't want to do it. They want to sing, right? Or, you know, like, and so that's tough. You see it in athletics. Like, people don't understand athletes. The amount of athletes that just do it because it was the best way, for, in the same way that somebody goes and becomes an accountant, and they don't love competition, and they don't love the sport. It's crazy, you know, when you look at them because you're like, you're one of the 15, best, you know, and they don't love it which is why they're not the greatest athlete of all time. The greatest athletes of all time are the ones who love it and have it. And so I think what you need to do is taste everything. It's kind of like food. You don't know what your favorite food is if you only eat one food. So I would take advantage of your youth and, uh, and your flexibility at this kind of age and try to taste everything, play with everything, figure out what you might be good at, what you might like, and then you make a decision. Uh, you know, when I think about being 41 years old, and feeling as young as I, I feel like I'm 10 years old. Like I feel like I have my whole life in front of me. And I think it's very difficult for youngsters to realize that. I, I'm sure some of us that have lived a little bit longer, you know, you just don't, like when I was 20, how old are you? 26. When I was 26, 41 seemed like a fucking long way away. <laughs> you know, like, like my, my, eight, my eight, year old cousin, eight years older cousin who worked with me at Wine Library seemed old to me. At, you know, he was 34 when I was 26, so 41, fuck. Like, like it's funny for me to think about like, how you're seeing me, but I'm telling you, you're gonna feel exactly the way you feel right now at 41. And so that's interesting because when people understand that, you can start deploying more patience. Because right now you wanna prove it. You've got, right? Yeah, quickly. You know, I can read that because you're in the fake, like first words out of your mouth always are such an indicator of what's on your mind. You know, I don't, I never cared to fake it till I made it because I didn't care what people thought. When you can eliminate that, shit changes real quick. You know, even think about high school and then going into college, like high school is so tough for people because it's the apex of when everything's about what other people think. And then you love the transition to university or the last year of high school because you care a little less, right? But, <sighs> Those first couple of years of high school, I don't know the school system exactly how you guys do it here, but like, ev- like everybody's wrapped up in that 12 to 17 year old age of like everything's about what everybody else thinks and that's why so many people hate that era. I just never went through that luckily, just hardwiring, good parenting, serendipity, circumstance, wrapping my self esteem in things that I was great at. Not really, I'm not really good at thinking about what I'm bad at. Even in interviews, the only time I get stumped is they're like, what do you struggle with? Or, or what, what's a failure? I'm like, uh, I just don't even like quantify it. I don't think it's worth it. I think people dwell too much. So what is the best collaboration that either you've had in some of your businesses or that you've seen happen in startups? I give away all my best advice. Mm-hmm. I'm sh- a daily V, I'm showing inside meetings to what the strategy of my company is and my competitors can just watch it and copy it. I mean, it's crazy what I'm actually doing because it speaks to my confidence that I'm always going to keep inventing the next thing and my understanding that 99% of people aren't going to do anything about it anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just bought Pure Wow, which is a women's media publishing company. It's like a Refinery29 competitor. I saw the Refinery29 CEO at CS and I rolled up on him and we've been friends for a long time, acquaintances, friendly. And he had, he, he had a good vibe, but like I addressed it immediately. I'm like, listen, you know I want to rip your head off. Like that, I'm competitive, it's a game. Like that's what I do. I'm like, but, but then I said to him, you know, but, but honestly, I think we should join up and we should go after Condé Nest and, and Hearst and there's much bigger media women companies than us. Together we can really do some damage and I don't care if I get 50 cents or 30 cents on the dollar. I, I think the best collaborations are the most unlikely. When Burger King asked McDonald's, on that 
like that f- campaign they did, I don't know if you guys saw this, where they asked to make a, a love child of the Big Mac and the Whopper. Yeah. To me, there's, if tomorrow Nike and Adidas in the height of Yeezy's going after the Nike brand did a collaboration, to me, you even said it, the most unlikely ones. It's easy when a crayon company does a JV with like a sock company and they make a co-pack. Like, they're not really competing. I think the most interesting ones are when you have real genuine competition and people collaborate. Uh, and so I think the ones that are most interesting is when Facebook and Snapchat mm-hmm. will have secret meetings and say, you know what, we have to team up on vertical video mm-hmm. because that's bigger than what we're competing against each other because we have to take down television ads. That's inter- You know, I love that stuff. Yeah. You know, I know that's pretty frothy, but I think that's when it gets most interesting. So, so FedEx and UPS should get together and say, listen, Amazon and Uber are dangerous. What can we do together? So disrupt the disruptors. Disrupt the disruptors. And it's most interesting to me when the incumbents that are on the verge of being disrupted are smart enough to disrupt. Mm-hmm. So like for example, every hotel company in, a, in the world should have gotten together, threw money together, and then bought residential and then created an Airbnb competitor. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. That to me is really neat. Now I know that's pretty heady. On a more small business level, I think it gets really interesting when the next generation comes in and they yell at their father that not everything is competition and you can do business with the guy down the street. My best collaborations was when I had no money. When Wine Library had no money, none. We were doing $3.8 million, $3. million a year, 10% gross profit before expense. We had no money, there was no marketing budget. My first year's marketing budget was $14,000. What did I do? I went to a lot of the other local businesses in Milburn and asked them if I could put a bottle of wine on their counter at the barber shop with little coupons. So what do you think holds people back? I mean, you're, you're Gary Vee. Okay? Yes. So, and you've always had that. Yes. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna fix the Yes. Problem. What do you think holds people back from those? Hu- where, where hum- fear? Human inefficiencies. Yeah. Fear, ego. Yeah. I don't need you. Yeah. I can do it. Uh, uh, Cynicism, Mm -hmm. I don't trust you. You're not gonna leave, when I leave, you're gonna just take the flyers, throw them in the garbage and drink my wine. That's what holds my dad back. Cynicism, you know? Yeah, cynicism. My first question is, you talk a lot about young people not having enough patience. Yes. Uh, What do you think are the other major factors that young people don't really have today that hold people back? Experience. You know, I think, I think young kids are getting tricked right now and think just because it's a technology boom and just because they understand it that they have this great advantage over 45-year-old executors. It's audacity, which I love. Channeled properly, it gives them the lack of fear to do things. So I really don't talk a lot about it because I don't want to stop it because I think it's their greatest gift as well. But I think it's patience. I think it's lack of experience. And the biggest one is lack of talent. Every young kid thinks they're entitled to be an entrepreneur now. It's the cool thing. Truth is, it's not gonna work out. Like, it just isn't. The math doesn't work out. Like, 98% of the people that are starting startups are gonna lose. And again, the reason I started with the economic, like, the economic growth of the globe is keeping a fake entrepreneur alive. Most of your friends that in their 20s that have businesses aren't actually making money if they're in tech. They've raised capital and they're losing money every month. That's ultimately something that doesn't work out. And then just a second question, sorry. Uh, a lot of time I do web design development a lot for small businesses. A lot of time I can go in, I can show a portfolio, I can say I want to expand that portfolio and they still might choose paying like 5,000 euro ridiculous amounts of money when I can say I can do the same work, here's the work that I've done. Is there any way of combating that? No. no. You're, being, you're being subjected to age discrimination. So the way to combat it is to not dwell on it and not try to sell people who aren't sellable. It's a volume game. Just go to every business instead of focusing on trying to convince the dog shop owner that he's making a mistake. Though one of the great things I've always done, because I started off as a young kid and nobody, I mean, I, I started off as, like they would walk into my family business and I'm like, can I help you with wine? And they're like, you can't help me with wine. 
for the first seven years they were right. I was 15 years old. They made, they were, but I knew a lot more and if they gave me data I could tell them what they should drink. But I think that um, one thing I learned very early on by all that rejection, both being a bad student and both being a kid that tried to sell wine when he was underage and nobody would listen to him, is that, is that you can't sell people that aren't sellable. You're way better off putting your energy and crushing it for the people that give you an at bat, right? Versus the people that aren't. What does it take for you to invest in a company? And then two, um, preschools, it's a niche market. I have a master's in preschool education, I have a degree, but I still feel, I've talked to over a thousand preschool providers, done surveys with them, I'm talking to them every day, but I'm still not sure how to market the product to them, just because it's small and yeah. So what would be your advice on marketing to me? As far as investing, you've kind of heard my themes. I've not been investing much at all. I'm about to do this new Apple show where I'm one of the you know, mentors and I think it's gonna put me in the light of investing a lot again. So I'm gonna, I have to figure out what my strategy is because I'm gonna have a great amount of deal flow. Um, but I do think we're in an oversaturated, overvalued market. So I've been doing almost no investing. Uh, if I was to invest now, it's only betting on the jockey and they've had to be successful before. Like, now listen, Mark Zuckerberg was not successful before. Evan Spiegel was not successful before. I'm gonna leave money on the table in an incredible way by having that strategy. I just need to go through this cycle. I don't like it right now. And so I'd rather invest in somebody who's done it before and is on their second or third because it gives me data that they've been able to navigate actually building a business versus building a machine that's built for fundraising because that's the majority of what's being built right now. And like it's preschools, they're not really business people, they're not enterprise. So like, I just feel like, should I go out to them and talk to them one-on-one or should it be digital? No, you should go talk to them one-on-one. The best thing to do ever is to go one-on-one and reverse engineer what made you get the first 10 people to buy it and then make that your strategy. I'm a very big fan of that. Like, instead of guessing what it's gonna be, go and sell it, see what the common theme was that made people buy it and then scale that in your communications. Digital is not a, it's not a tactic. Digital is where people's attention is. So what you put into the digital is what matters. Just having a Facebook strategy, right? It's what you say. Like the creative is still the variable of success. It's what you say. So we're really depending on our community and our followers um, to which we attract funds, uh, volunteers who join us on the projects uh, we're doing abroad, we're doing one in Kenya. Um, it took us quite a, yeah, let's say six months to get to, uh, let's say about, around 1,000 followers, different uh, media. Um, what, what kind of tips or strategy do you have to get to the next, let's say, 10,000? Um, so first of all, you shouldn't worry about things like that. No, okay. like, like in general, just even worrying about those proxies. Like to me, I assume you're talking about 1,000 followers across Facebook, Twitter, like things like that? Yeah. Is that what you mean? So first of all, I think the bigger question is what does that mean? So for example, my, quality, yeah, you know quality, what I mean? Quality, 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 of course, it's depth quality, versus width. So if your only KPI was 10,000 followers, we could create a word of mouth distribution strategy that yeah. could, right? Like yeah. click this, it auto populates all this. It, you gamify why people follow you. I mean you can give away an iWatch and, and, like, and pick up 500 followers, right? Exactly. So I, I think that you need, to, you need to think about it differently. So for example, if the head of the United Nations was one of your followers and wanted to always talk about what you're doing, that's far more interesting to me than having 48,000 random people following you on Instagram. Mm-hmm. I think that's the real answer. Mm-hmm. The way to get to the best version of that real answer is content. And so what I would do if I were you guys is I would shift into the mindset of thinking that you're a media company comma, NGO. And what that would do, and I actually think that's the advice I'd give all of you. So I think you should blog every day about the world of preschool and art, like everything. Profile a teacher, speak about something that happened 50 years ago, a media company. If you all think of yourself as a media company, media content is the gateway to the business. Look what I do. I, Gary, am a media company. It's the gateway to building the fastest, biggest growing agency in the history of advertising. (laughs) <laughs> I always say to people, if they really pay attention to what I'm doing, they'll get much more value out of me than anything else. 
like why am I making so much video? Why am I documenting everything? Why am I you know, producing a t-shirt? Why am I doing the Apple show? Why, why am I doing what I'm doing? No matter, I'll never be as, as great as a communicator as I am, right? And I'm really good at it and it's why I've been successful. I'll never be able to fully synthesize ahead of my own actions. So what does that mean? That means you should write a medium blog post every week. It means that you should do a podcast in the NGO space every week. Why did Scott Harrison and Adam Braun from Pop and Pencils of Promise, excuse me, Pencil Promise and Charity Water become such players? Because they were they were club promoters, they were marketers, they were they they treated it differently. And and the truth is, too many people in the NGO spoke NGO space take for granted people's goodwill. They think just because they're an NGO, people should give a shit. There's a drillion NGOs. There's a drillion things that are trying to do good for the world. So content, podcast, video, written, quotes, pictures, and then tactics. 15 hashtags when you post your picture on Instagram three times a day. Now we speak with a lot of individuals who want to join our, our cause and they want to join our projects. But we also speak to a lot of like companies and we spoke about like a corporate social responsibility. Of course. Um, I'm curious in your scene if, if you ever come across these kind of subjects and, and what's interesting for them, so what we could offer companies in terms of... The first thing you have to do is realize they're full of shit. <laughs> 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 they just are. It's like, global. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's companies do for purpose 99.7% of time for commerce interests. They think it looks good to the person they're trying to sell soap to. Machine to fund, right? yeah, yeah. And so the second you take the romance out of it and say, okay, great. The, this g- company is very excited about us. They're not excited about you. They're excited about using you as a proxy to make themselves look like, the reason I never talk about my nonprofit work, which is substantial, financially, and time committed, is because I am disgusted by my fancy friends that use it to paint a picture that they're a good human being. I love that people, some people think that I'm too self-promotional. I'm comfortable promoting about my vanity. I'm not comfortable in promoting my heart. I think that you just do that. So it's the reverse, you know, I love when people razz me and fall for tricks of what other people are doing. It's just very basic thinking. I think when you take the romance out, you've got a much better chance of being successful with those companies. If you walk in there and realize, okay, this is business and what they really care about is their brand being associated with something that's good, which then leads to more selling stuff, your strategies start changing on what you say you're willing to do with them. You start getting more of them to do things that you want to do. Mm-hmm. You always have to know what the real game is. Yeah. Um, a lot of the time, I'm, I'm saying I'm full single mom with very little bit extra family support. And I don't yes. Know that. Crazy it's hard. Is very great. It's hard. It's really hard. Really hard. And when I find that although all starts up go slow and the patient's there and I you're gonna be sl- you're gonna be slower. Oh, it's you're gonna be slower. And how do I communicate that? Because that is communicate to who? Understood. The world? No, well, say I'm from Galway, the smaller area. I don't know. It's it's a you're almost dealing very personal with the people who are kind of the key holders or the gatekeepers of that city within. In okay. The, well, what do you what what do you what do you need from them? I need to get into an accelerator to get into that structure nearly to get like we'll say this one interest that's fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand would absolutely change my life. I think I think of, like it's ridiculous. But like, I I think you have to go to the decision maker in that accelerator. Yeah. Tell the truth of your world, and realize that ninety nine percent of decision makers in that situation aren't going to give a shit about your hepatic. But it actually came back to me. The head one of these came back to me while I was in a meeting discussing and getting financially like your yeah. financial advisor, bit chef. We can yeah. help you there. And then this guy walked up and he, he actually felt a bit. I felt like he was threatened. Like he's in his sixties or something. And he was like, "Oh, you! I remember from six months ago you applied. You're a single mom, aren't you? You're." And he was not. Keep going. Friend. He was like, "How old is he now? 10, 11? And I, I honestly felt like he was like blocking me. It was so bizarre. Now I, I moved on with it and you wouldn't have noticed that. If I was there I'd have been like, yeah, my God, he's great. And anyways, da 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 but inside, inside it's like he's just one of the ninety nine. You just gotta find <laughs> you, you know, you just gotta find the one. And is there like And and by and by the way, and by the way, I do wanna say something. 
because people don't think about this, because I just went through this with this new Apple show. He's got a fiscal responsibility. These accelerators were given money by people. <laughs> like, like, you know, like, it's, you know the, raw, the raw game of business is very unforgiving. I don't think these VCs, I razz them all the time because I want to remind entrepreneurs that their model is the following. They're gonna give you all bad advice except for the one that gets through and pays for everything. They're gonna push all your companies too hard and not patience because their model is predicated on getting one to break through and pay for the whole fund. So they push everybody to be a huge exit. Most fail, one gets through, they win. But the truth is, somebody gave them money. When I write a check as an LP, a limited partner, and I write a $500,000 check, I'm trusting that individual to return my money and with profit. I could put it in the stock market. I could buy real estate. I can, this is my family. I earned my money. So, so they have a responsibility. So now, I think there's grace and I think there's ways to be a polite human being. Um, and I think, yeah, but the world's, a, honestly, the world's a funny place, right? Like I think the reason I over-index is I've found some sort of balance. I've, I'm me. I'm massively aggressive and a good dude and people are able to like, get real, you know, I'm, I, I'm giving you an answer that most people aren't giving, which is, I'm not so sold they're wrong. But I do believe that somebody will be like, hey, listen, I'm not worried that this may take 13 years or four or seven or nine. Problem is, they're impatient. Everybody's impatient. This is not just a young kid thing, the world's impatient. So I, I think, what, again, I think it's a similar answer I've given a couple times now. Let me give you a great macro piece of advice. Eliminate emotion. Be empathetic. You know what your headache is, like, hey, fuck you, asshole. I'm a single mom and I'm doing it right and I've got things to do. But be empathetic to him. I look at him and say, he might really need this exit. Like maybe he, you know, maybe, who the hell knows what happened in his life? Maybe he needs this investment period of his life. Everybody just assumes that because they're an accelerator, most of the people that I know that run accelerators have no money. Like this is the thing that needs to make them money. They worked 15 years to build a reputation to be able to get people that had money to give them money and this is the moment. This is it. Yeah. So you know when you go to that, it's why I never get mad about anything. Right? I mean, you see D-Rock reacting. Doesn't, like, like, it's why I don't get mad. If somebody says you, you're a con artist, I'm like okay, you watched four seconds of one video where I was peacocking and being my egotistical cocky self and that's what you think and I get it, fine. Like, I don't expect you to, you know, people come up to me at events like this, like, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. All these people, I'm like, you don't need to be sorry. 99% of the world doesn't know. Like, like, to me, I think empathy is lacking in our world. I think the political climate in all of our countries and, and Europe and the US is lacking empathy. We're going this way instead of this way and, it, and there's no, neither side is right about that. So we lack empathy. Empathy has been my calling card. What I have done is started with two tech um, media and opened up a thrift shop based on following you. The thrift shop <laughs> is so awesome. I'm, I really think that selling, like buying something and selling it the reason I'm more excited about it than people realize is I think I'm teaching a lot of people a true survival skill. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. when you act, like the amount of people that are actually gonna have a successful startup because on the side they were going to bookstores buying and selling and when shit hits the fan they'll have a little money to stay alive just long enough to get out to the other side and win. There's, I'm so proud, this may be, it's such a funny thing It seems so weird, like a lot of my tech friends are like, what are you doing? But I'm really excited about it because I think a lot of you are gonna learn how to sell. We're doing the 20K. You are. It's cool, (laughs) it's cool, right? Yeah, it's cool. It's it's just like, and the other thing is like, a lot of people need money. Like having extra money really impacts 97% of people and so no matter where you are on the economic scale, Selling random stuff in your house that you're not using and having an extra thousand euros at the end of the year is better than not. And you learn something. It's a real win-win. It's a real win-win. It's been really fun. It's been really fun to watch. (laughs) 